Hi, everyone. So, uh, conventional wisdom is wrong. It's, uh, I think, what excites every entrepreneur. You can go out and find, uh, I think well, there's a lot of companies that are started based on entrepreneurs thinking that conventional wisdom is inaccurate. And uh, the bigger the problem, um, the bigger the opportunity. And I think there's a $10 billion conventional wisdom problem going on right now. So, uh, and that is that BI generally works. And I don't think that it does at all. And uh, you walk around the conference and you, you hear about big data. You know, everything that we're hearing about right now is uh, how can you get more billions of rows of data and more petabytes of data and do real-time ad hoc analysis in memory on your iPhone. And if you've got any kind of idea along those lines, and particularly if you're of Eastern European descent, you can get 25 million bucks from any unsuspecting VC. And uh, that seems like that's kind of what's going on right now. And it reminds me of you know, when we started uh, Omniture back in 96, you know, conventional wisdom was anybody that was a Stanford MBA needed 25 million bucks. We're in Utah, so yeah, we got a little chip on our shoulder. Um, and you know, at the time, it was, it was everyone was focused on how to make bigger data systems. If you're using big sunboxes and big giant licenses from Oracle, then you probably have a better, better mousetrap. And at the time, we were doing Linux, MySQL, and we were focused on the customer that was trying to make money versus collect more data. And I still think, you know, we're here talking about data, 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 instead of what our customers are doing with it, which is they're all trying to make money from this data. So, you know, if you go and you look at uh, my own personal experience, we were sitting there running on the and had trillions of, trillions of uh, pieces of data that we were managing every single quarter for our customers. And I look at my own business and the way that I ran my own business, and I couldn't tell you in real time how many employees I had. I could tell you within 25, but I had to wait for my monthly report to come out. And I'm like, there's got to be a better way to do this. I have all this real-time data about online marketing events because it's all out there in the cloud. There's got to be a better way to connect all these different systems. And so we went and, uh, started, went and started this company called Domo. And uh, Domo means thank you in Japanese. And the reason I like the name Domo is because in software as a service, you're it's recurring revenue. You have to get those customers to like the product every single year. And so we say we want to work really hard until our customers say one thing, and that's thank you. Because then that means we have the right relationship versus churn and burn of your licensed software of old. And uh, we just did a launch party out in Utah, had a thousand people come, close to a thousand people come to the party, and we had Stephen Dubner come. And uh, I think he's made, a, he's made a business out of talking about conventional wisdom. And, and uh, it was really interesting, Freakonomics, um, some of the things that he talked about. One of the things he talked about, and being in Utah and kind of the capital of the NRA, um, I had a CFO that worked for me that was from California, and he freaked out that there were so many guns in Utah. And Dubner comes out and he's talking about, uh, you know, actually, uh, if you have guns in your house and pools in your house, your kids are 100 times more likely to die from the pool. Um, and he went out and he did you know, some surveys and found that the conventional wisdom would certainly say something different if you talk to the average person. So you go out and you look at, uh, you know, conventional wisdom, and I think um, you look in history, and I think it's interesting just to see how often we've been wrong. And starting with the world is flat, and I'm not talking about the Friedman ilk. Uh, you look at, here's some ads that are pretty humorous uh, from the 20s. Get your baby to drink beer through mommy. Um, the more malt the baby gets, the better off the baby's going to be. Uh, you know, conventional wisdom was wrong here. Uh, this is a great ad from Camel. More doctors smoke Camel cigarettes than any other brand of cigarettes. And uh, this reminds me a little bit of, um, I don't drink beer. I'm a Mormon. And um, not of the cult sort. Uh, but the... Um, you know, when I, when I saw the, the, there's an ad, a great ad campaign, um, the most interesting man in the world, Dosa Kis. And uh, when I see that ad, it kind of reminds me of this. You know, he's, uh, I don't always drink beer, but when I, when I do, I prefer Dosa Kis. <laughs> Keep drinking, my friends, or stay thirsty, my friends. And, um, but I think, you know, not only has it been wrong historically, but uh, I think recently, you know, again, Utah, you look at Jimmer. You know, can a six-foot white guy from BYU be the National Collegiate Player of the Year? And we're still celebrating this. NBA season hasn't started yet, so we still get to celebrate this. But yeah, you know, he, he can and was one of the first unanimous Collegiate Players of the Year in a while. And 
Oh, this one, I don't know why they put this one in here. Um, I actually use this. It works quite well, as you can tell. Um, but also, you know, you can't make great companies outside Silicon Valley. And I can't tell you when I was building Omniture how many times I was frustrated that we would come out and try to raise money and we would get one-fourth the valuation of our competitors who were the exact same size and we felt like we were beating. Um, but you can make great companies outside Silicon Valley. And uh, you know, we were the number one recurring venture-backed uh, investment of 2004. That was quite a while ago. Um, number two performing IPO of 2006. But more importantly, you know, we had over a trillion transactions that we were, we were performing every single quarter. And the reason that we won was we weren't focused on the data. We were focused on what to do with it. And I still think that's the problem when you look at, you know, when you look at the, the BI space and big data space. And right now, one of the things that everyone's saying is, the team with the best data analysts, you've got to have all these data analysts. And if you do, you're going to win. And you're going to be smarter than all your competition. And I think that's kind of like missing the forest for the trees and tripping over the dollars to pick up the, pick up the pennies. You know, it's, it's, you're focused on the 2% that make all the noise. And they're the ones that complain. And they're the ones that have had all the access to all these great systems. But, uh, you know, there's the other 98% of the people out there that don't have access to data systems, that don't want to do real-time analysis on their laptop, that don't ever want to hear the word pivot table. And that's where we're focused. And when I was the CEO of a public company, there was so much data that I didn't get to see except for once a month. And we're really trying to change that. Uh, I think, you know, other conventional wisdom. Executives have access to all the important data. I read an interesting article recently by, uh, about Alan Mullally at Ford, and he said when he got there from Boeing, he was in a meeting and he was asking about all of the, he was getting an update from all the managers, and every single person was giving him good news. He was like, what is going on around here? I'm pretty sure I got this job because we suck at a couple of things, <laughs> you know? And finally somebody raised, he didn't say that, but someone raised their hand and said, I think we actually might miss, miss our, our build date because we've got a defective product. And he said he stood up and clapped in front of everybody for this guy because he was finally getting some unfiltered feedback. And you know, why do you have to have, why do you have to rely on your managers to do that? There's, the data is there. So why isn't it being surfaced to you? Why do you have to rely on someone to massage the data and get it to you once every, every month or once every quarter or once every week at most if you're lucky? You know, another example, I was reading about Jamie Dimon at J.P. Morgan, and they famously weathered the storm fairly well compared to everyone else in the financial crisis. And then I was reading the article about how they did it. And it was like a 17-page article in one of those business pubs. And it was, Alan, I mean, Jamie was reading a report on a Saturday morning, and he happened to read page six, and he happened to read a couple paragraphs deep, and he saw something that alarmed him and made him question what was going on. And he went back to the office on Monday, and he asked his team to investigate it, and they investigated it, and they found that there might be a problem with some mortgage-backed securities. And so they decided to get out of mortgage-backed securities. And it was like this great article about how smart they are at J.P. Morgan. And I'm sure they are. But we're relying on a CEO to look at a report and happen to read page six? That's crazy to me. When the data was there. The data was there. And so what, we're going to go make the analysts even smarter and rely on them? Why isn't there a way to collaborate and communicate about this data? And, and that's, what we're trying to, that's what we're trying to do at Domo. And the last one is business intelligence works. I sat down with the Fortune 500 CEO of a bank, and this, it really blew me away. I uh, was talking to him about his system that he was using, and he said, you know, this, I like what you're talking about here. This is really exciting. I said, what data would you want to know in real time? What would you want to see on a daily basis? What would you not want to have to call someone? He's like, I can get any data. I have to call someone and wait for a day to a week to get it back. And he's like, you know what I would really want to know? I'd love to know my deposits. I'm <laughs> like, you're a bank, you know? You're like, yeah, but we got three different systems. We've acquired a bunch of companies, and, you know, I can get it, but I got to wait for someone to add it up. And he's like, the other thing I'd like to see, we have, we're working out a bunch of loans. I'd love to not have to work out the loans. I got another Fortune 500 company, and they're trying to figure out how to map treasury data that's out there in the public with the information they have internally and put that together in a system and make it available to their executives, and they can't figure out how to do it. You know, and it's, it's, we've got a top three tech company that's got point of sale systems all over the place, and they manage it on an Excel spreadsheet to see which system's up, which one's down, which one's sick. 
and they're trying to figure out how to do that in real time. So there's so much opportunity out there. The business intelligence space does not work. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how many billions of rows you can crunch. Are you getting the right information in the executive's hands so they can manage the business? And that's what we're focused on. So back to the words of Dosa Keys. You know, you can't always get lightning to strike when you wanted to, but when you do, I prefer it twice. So stay, th stay thirsty, my friends. Thanks. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. That was great. Thank you very much.